have you seated or all the hands moving? Yes. That's the way we have to listen. So welcome to our International Dance Day, I hope you're enjoying it so far. Uh, my name is David, if you don't know me, and I'm one of the teachers here. Uh, but I also teach uh, several theoretical subjects at the UOC. And today I'm going to give you a little lecture for the International Dance Day to basically you know, give you an idea of different cultural dances and the place of dance in, in the world and how it affects us and the people around us. So what is dance for you guys? Can somebody tell me what is dance? Freedom. Fun. Okay, freedom, fun. Expression. Movement. Expression, movement. Anything else? Emotion. Emotion. Uh, introspective. Introspective. Yeah. Energy. <laughs> good. These are all good answers. Um, now, Here's some of the ones that I compiled from my own ideas and ideas that I've learned about. Some of them expression, forms of art, of course, you mentioned. Movement, somebody said. Uh, celebration is generally something that people dance at, so these are celebratory gestures. Uh, is it uniquely human? What do you think? Do animals dance? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've recently seen this video of a bird, like really practicing and then doing really fun dance, it was awesome. But for many years it was held that dance was a uniquely human expression, so that's why I put a question mark there. Anyway, besides that, it's an uh, aesthetic value system and a social code. So, especially if you look at ballroom dance, the way that, that people express it, and it represents a lot of things. Um, if you just think about ballroom dance, what, what does it make you think about? Love. Huh? Love. Love, okay. Anything else? Elegance. Elegance. Yeah. L'amour. L'amour. Yeah. <laughs> so, passion, yeah. And, and what I would like to point to is, is that Ballroom dance has a very specific expression. It, it comes from the courts of Europe. And it's, really, it's the way that we behave, the way that we move, the way that we gesture in this dance form is uh, very specific of the romanticism of the area of the court behavior. Ballet came out from the same courts, right? So uh, the facts of what we consider etiquette or, or elegance, as we say, is very cultural, right? I mean, look at, do you think that hip-hop is not elegant? I think, it could be. <laughs> I think he would like to differently. <laughs> <See? laughs> Thanks, exactly. They've made my point. There we go. So what I'm trying to say is that dance has a lot more than just a, a meaning as a physical thing that we do or, or something fun or, or something that we see as, as a representation of something. Dance can actually have different connotations for different people and the things that we think of as dance or being elegant or, or romantic or so on are very specific to the culture that we, you, you're living in. So, it may be for us that this, this being tall and being upright is, is very appropriate and very gesturally um, indicative of, of a higher elite society, in fact, which then creates the elegance for us up to this day. You know, and, and why is it that we can all come to this place in jogging pants, right? Again. And it's all, it's all very relative to where you are and what you're doing. Uh, so, this is one little definition of a famous anthropologist that uh, tried to define dance in some way. And it's, as you see, very inclusive, because uh, in anthropology they study different cultures and remote cultures. So she tried to basically find a different way to look at dance and find 
more, give more scope to what it means, especially for Europe, where uh, Europe and America, of course, where we have kind of uh, taken over of definitions of things in many ways and where we are right now. So what I would like to do now is, is give you some more examples of what kind of dancing there is out there. This particular anthropologist studied native dancing and uh, Hopi dancing in particular. And uh, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention a little bit of the similarities as well as the differences between Hopi dancing and ballet, let's say. So, uh, in the times of, let's say, around 1930s, books were written about uh, native dancers that would write that the natives would, would dance uh, from, like, they, they, they had passion. They, they, they danced emotionally, they were sometimes in a frenzy and uh, they would throw themselves in the mud and just give rise to their natural expressions. Which now, of course, has been uh, disproved and uh, if you study a lot of these dancers, dancers closely, you will notice a lot of the same, uh, the same structures, the same ideas as you find in ballet or ballroom. But again, they're not wearing suits, they're not so high up, and they're not accommodating our ideas of what dance is. So these are just some of those things that, that they have. And, but they have a clear structure, clear organization. They're much more into the ground. A lot of their dancers express animal, uh, animal behavior or uh, give a, right, basically give a respect to the spirits of the animals. Right? So there's different uh, meanings to those dances. In the same way that ballet gives a lot of meaning to the religious religions of the West, right? A lot of the ideology about the uh, fairies and the angels and the romanticism that exists in ballet and also in ballroom comes from our the narrative of the history of Europe, right? So in the same way, their own history expressed in a different way has this elegance, but expressed in a different manner. So let's take a look at uh, a little hockey dance. So it's going to be the first video in the, the let me see, what is it? Yeah. So watch for elements of structure, organization. It's the, yeah, but it's the volume. So this is the buffalo dance from the American hockey. So, as people who dance at this... <laughs> Yeah. 
This is the Code du Ballet, so the group of the ballet, not the soloist of the Royal Ballet. And basically they're talking about how important I don't know you have it. How important the, the, the group, the supporting group is to the actual uh, performance itself and how they have to be together, they have to be in sync and sound and so on in order to make an um, impactful performance. Right? And the qualities, if you notice some of the differences between the hobbies and the ballet, for example, you can see whether they're grounded or whether they're airy. What kind of costumes are they wearing? What kind of animals are they revering on that matter? One was about buffalo, this one is about swans. And what's up with the tutus, right? Why are they wearing those tutus? And also you have to interchange, you'll see in Act 1 there, the girls are dancing as peasants and quite sort of earthy movements. And Act 2, which is a very quick change, and the way you approach the movement is also very different movements. Um, then Act 3 you go into character dances, so you put heel shoes on and your feet get fat and uh, uh, you change your hair again, change your costume again and then in Act 4 you go back to being a swan. So I always found that incredibly challenging physically, mentally, in every sense. The white acts to begin with, um, Acts 2 and 4, it, they're just so intense and we'll be dancing for a big chunk and then we'll have a lot of stands. Um, and Sometimes you look and no one would know how painful those stands are. They just, they really hurt. And just, you know, not being able to, to move, but just keeping pulled up and keeping that position. It's, it's really tough once you've been, when you've just suddenly stopped being dancing and then you've got to keep going again. I've got such enormous respect for those girls because I have been there. And I know how it feels, I know how your legs feel, and I know how your brain feels. Um, so, I, you know, I just couldn't, I, I can't thank them enough to be there for me, because I take quite a lot of energy from them. You guys must be natural, right? Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> Anyway, just to give you a glimpse of the similarities that exist. So the narrative is the narrative of the peasant Europe. The costumes are of different animals. The qualities and the aesthetics are of airiness versus groundness. Uh, the music is not even played live in, in most of the Western concerts, which is a big element of uh, ballet and ballroom and so on. Um, so I, to, to begin this, I just wanted to kind of ground it, make it level from the beginning. And now we can begin to continue to other countries and discuss a little bit the other types of dances that exist. And you can look for the same elements of the aesthetics, of the values, and of the representations that they have for each culture, and why those people dance what they dance. In Europe, dancing has developed as a sort of a concept performance coming from the courts. In many other cultures, dancers are still danced very socially, and often as a group, as a celebration, so there's not just not, not as much division between the dancer and, and, the, and the group in which they live and, and reside in, basically. So sometimes the whole community creates the dance. The musicians in many of the Latin American countries represent as much as the dancers, and often the dancers must know music in order to actually dance. So um, there are very different approaches to what that is. Also, religious connotations often make a, in, in a sense, where, where you dance as a praise, as, as a prayer for things, whether that is valued as the main thing or not. Because in our secular society now, it's not so valued. Uh, we kind of divided the two, but you can still see remnants of that within our dancing. In other cultures, it's a constant, so they dance for the holidays, for the gods, and so on and so on. So let's continue to the next, uh, next dance form that I was going to. This is, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of Asian forms. And the first one is Le Grand Grasson, which is basically uh, a classical form that the children have to be trained in from a very young age. It represents a princess that has been kidnapped and basically is trying to find her way. And it's very delicate. One of the main uh, interesting ideas about it is, is the uh, 
uh, isolation of the movements. So even uh, to the point where even the eyes make a difference. So if you ever seen this type of dance, you can see the dancing with the eyes, which is not something that we often see uh, in our forms. And every little gesture, a bit like in the Indian dances, has a lot of representations culturally, which all of the audiences know and can read the dance in that manner. Okay, let's see the next one. So this is uh, just a video. So here's a little clip from that performance. Right. Um, 
There's one with coconuts for boys about fighting, where different uh, guys dress up and they have little coconuts everywhere and they have a, basically like coconut fights in, in a dance manner. And the most popular actually, which was performed in the Canadian uh, 2015 uh, games, was uh, Sinclair, which is about a princess rescue, which is a combination of the bamboo sticks and, and uh, sort of a traditional dance at the same time. So now we'll watch the tinkling. So they actually went pretty slow. Uh, sometimes they get really quick and the dancers really have to kind of 